Hey everyone, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis, and today I've got Dr. Adam Harwood from uh, Bab- uh, from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I knew I was going to stumble over my words there. Uh, uh, and today we're going to be discussing anthropology, the nature of man, original sin, and how that relates to the conversation of infants. Uh, it's going to be an exciting conversation. I hope you guys stay tuned. Uh, but if you're out there and this is the first time you've tuned in to Remnant Radio, I want to let you know who we are uh, and what we do. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast where we interview pastors, teachers, theologians, historians from different churches and denominations. Our goal is to kind of get you outside of your theological echo chambers, uh, you know, use some uh, uh, neuroplasticity, right, grow yourself uh, in the way that you, you've you learned Christian theology. We find that often we're raised in our denominations, uh, and we're not aware that there's just a rich uh, diversity of opinions on Christian theology. Uh, so we constantly come out with content on theology, history, and the gifts of the Spirit. If that's content that you're interested in, make sure to subscribe as we're coming out with content just like this every single week. Uh, Dr. Harwood, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, Before we dive into our subject matter, can you let our audience know a little bit about you and your ministry? Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Josh. Um, I'm a seminary professor, uh, as you mentioned, and I've been at New Orleans Seminary since 2013. Prior to that, I taught at a Baptist college in North Georgia called Truett McConnell. Uh, taught there for four years, and before that, I served on church staff in Texas and Oklahoma for a dozen years at uh, Baptist churches. Came to faith in Christ at a young age, was raised in a Christian home, and I see my ministry now as primarily equipping the saints for works of ministry uh, by equipping the next generation of pastors and teachers and and missionaries. In addition, I serve in the Army National Guard as a chaplain and um, have been mobilized and so am currently deployed serving as a chaplain in the Middle East. So uh, there's going to be a delay when we talk and there's a chance that the uh, Wi-Fi may get a little bit weak, and that's why. Excellent. Well, uh, not to worry about that at all. Thank you so much for your service to our country. How long are you deployed? Uh, until uh, near the end of this year. Okay. Okay. Not too bad. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious. Can you, can you tell our audience some of the books that you have published? I've read one of them uh, this last week in pre- preparation for our discussion today. Uh, but l- let us know some of the books that you've published, articles you have online, places where people can follow and learn more about this discussion, since our interview is only going to be an hour long and there's so much to talk about here. Uh, let people know where they can find more of your content. Okay. If, if you look on Amazon, you'll find those publications the Spiritual Condition of Infants is a book that was a revision of my PhD dissertation, and it was published 10 years ago this month, The Spiritual Condition of Infants. And uh, another book that I uh, edited was called Anyone Can Be Saved, and I contributed some articles and edited that book. Um, and there are other Uh, books that I've contributed to. Uh, There's an evangelism book uh, where I wrote a chapter on uh, theology of evangelism. And uh, I also edited, uh, was one of the editors of a book called Infants and Children in the Church. And that was published by B&H Academic. And that is a five views book where I was the Baptist representative and there's a Lutheran, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and Presbyterian. That sounds like the beginning of a joke. But uh, all five of us um, uh, answered the same four questions about the spiritual condition of infants, uh, original sin, uh, infant salvation, entrance and discipleship in the church. So it's meant to focus on both theology and ministry. And that title is called Infants and Children in the Church. And I have a a website that I I don't do a lot to maintain uh, nowadays, uh, but there are several articles and links uh, to video presentations, and it's simply adamharwood.com. Excellent. Well, I'm I'm looking at uh, some of the questions I've got lined up, and I think probably the most important question that we could probably ask in our discussion, just kind of uh, to pr- to get to to give this presentation um, before we even talk about originus, and let's talk about inherited guilt. Um, and why that's important for anthropology and specifically the, the anthrop- 
<laughs> anthropological uh, position of infants. Uh, can, you, can you speak to what is inherited guilt and how it's been viewed in kind of an Augustinian light? Certainly. So over the course of Christian history, all Christians, and by that I mean uh, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, uh, Protestant, different variations in denominations of Christianity, all affirm some type of definition or view of original sin. And broadly, you can break those down into two categories. Uh, one you might call inherited guilt, and one you might call inherited corruption. And both of those positions have many different representatives and even confessional statements that support them. There has been no consensus in the history of the church. There's no ecumenical council that is recognized by the major uh, Christian groups that made any sort of statement on the do doctrine of sin or original sin, like the ecumenical councils that uh, made statements about the doctrine of the Trinity or the divinity of Christ. So Christians differ on this. Uh, they recognize that all people are sinners and that uh, all people need God's grace in Christ, um, but exactly how and when a person becomes a sinner or is accountable for sin uh, is, is debated. That first position, inherited guilt, is a position that uh, traces its roots historically to Augustine. He is uh, easily the most significant figure in Christian history uh, who has weighed in on that topic and to whom people refer uh, when they uh, hold this position. Mm. <clears throat> his, uh, his view of original sin developed later in his life and ministry and it was informed by some presuppositions uh, which uh, are questionable, uh, presuppositions about, uh, for example, he held a view of uh, sexuality, even within the marriage relationship, that uh, procreation was something that was, uh, that resulted in defective human seed, and so um, uh, people are the result of parents coming together and through this procreative act, which um, um, he views in a negative way. Um, uh, God, God takes um, uh, from the lump of humanity, massa damnata, uh, this lump of clay in Romans 9, he views as this material from which all people are created. Uh, he refers to this repeatedly in his writings and from uh, this mass of damnation uh, creates each person or each person is created from this lump of sin, uh, which contains original sin. And so these sorts of views inform his uh, perspective so that later Augustinian writings uh, include statements about the condemnation of, of infants, even day old infants. And there are some biblical texts which uh, he uses to support that, which um, turns out don't provide strong support. Um, nevertheless, uh, this idea of inherited guilt has uh, been carried on and repeated by others in the Christian tradition and is very commonly found in, in works of systematic theology and, and is a legitimate um, position uh, in the church. So you, you made the statement that, um, so this is a position of many in evangelicalism today uh, throughout Throughout church history, this has been a popular position of inherited guilt. You also mentioned another position, what you called uh, inherited corruption. Can you explain to us what that is in light of that? Because it sounds as if if you're going to say, hey, we don't have original guilt, the, the kind of knee-jerk reaction to people who have studied, um, you know, 
small amounts of church history will go Pelagianism, right? Partial Pelagianism. It's like the, this knee jerk reaction where they have to like, it, if you disagree with Augustine about the nature of man, you're a Pelagian, right? So um, can, can you maybe explain to us the inherited corruption and those who were proponents of that throughout church history? Certainly. So inherited corruption would be the idea that there certainly is a link between all people and the first couple, Adam and Eve. And as a result of their disobedience in the garden, and specifically Adam is indicted in scripture, for example, Romans chapter five, that all people end up affected by his disobedience and impacted by sin. There are consequences for his sin and we are all regarded as sinners in some way and at some stage. And then the question is, how exactly do you flesh that out? Uh, regarding who are the early opponents, essentially the entire early church prior to Augustine held this view, not only in the Eastern tradition, but in the Western tradition. And uh, I could, I could uh, quote uh, examples for you, um, but uh, it's it's widely acknowledged among historical theologians that this idea of inherited guilt uh, was first popularized by Augustine and uh, essentially the the uh, the early church prior to him. Again, in both the Eastern and Western traditions held this view, which could be characterized as inherited consequences. And this is the idea that, that all people enter this world mortal and mortality is a consequence of Adam's sin. And so even before an infant is old enough to know the difference between right and wrong and commit a sinful act, they are still susceptible to physical death. Uh, and so that's, apart from any consideration of, of their guilt or assigning them uh, uh, God's judgment. I, yeah, and that was one of my questions that, were, that I have listed in here is about that of death, because it seems as if um, guilt, um, if someone is guilty, like in a court of law, and maybe we need to define guilt just for semantics, but um, when, if someone is guilty in a court of law, then they are, it is just for them to receive punishment for that guilt, right? And it seems as if we have received punishment for guilt being death. Um, now, you're saying that this is part of the corruption of the human nature and is not necessarily tied to guilt. Um, ha have there been argumentations uh, on this subject about death being proof of guilt or that um, this fallen world is proof of guilt? I, su I suppose the fallen world would be um, under the domain and headship of Adam, um, but I could see how individual death would be, w would appear to be evidence for a just punishment for, for sin or for guiltiness. Yes, that is, that is an argument that's sometimes made, and uh, there are different ways to trace this out where theologians will make this argument. Uh, one way to do it is to consider some of the examples in Scripture of infants and how they are spoken of and young children and the nature of God's judgment. Hmm. So, so perhaps one of the best known examples of the death of an infant in Scripture is the death of David and Bathsheba's child. Second uh, Samuel chapter 12 records uh, Nathan's rebuke of David. Remember when he points his finger and says, uh, after telling this story, telling this parable, he says, you were the man, and then announces God's judgment against their house. And uh, picking up in Second Samuel 12, verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. Oh. By Sorry, doing Adam. This, you have One shown second. Yes. You said the Lord has taken away your sin, and then you cut out. That's the first time we've had a skip, so we're still doing pretty well, good. Certainly. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, the the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. That's verse thirteen, and and now Nathan's going to begin talking about consequences of 
David's sin that are Because by doing this, you've shown utter contempt for the Lord. The son born to you will die. And your listeners uh, are probably familiar with the story, so they know the rest of the narrative. But uh, the child did, in fact, die. And so the, the question from this passage comes, why did David and Bathsheba's child die? Did the child die because of the sin and guilt passed on from Adam? Did the child die because Nathan said, this infant is guilty of your sin, David? Or uh, did, did the infant die as a consequence, as a result of David's sin, with no mention of any guilt or inheritance of guilt? And, and I, think the, I think that last explanation is the, is the best explanation for that particular passage. And it's an example of other people, even in this instance, an innocent person, the infant, being negatively impacted and not inheriting sin, not inheriting guilt, not being con condemned to separation from God, none of those things. But... Uh, his life ended as a consequence of David's sin, as judgment against their And so that's one example where you have specifically the mention of an infant and their, their death, and uh, it's possible to reconstruct some understanding of what's happening in that particular situation. Because of uh, David's sin, not, not the child's sin itself. Um, not sense. because the child's sin and not because of, of an inherited guilt or an inherited nature. Right. There's, a, there's another passage, if we have a moment, yeah, that, go ahead. that relates to this discussion. Um, remember the story of the 12 spies in mm -hmm. the Old Testament. Um, God promised the Israelites a land, so it's the promised land. And the 12 spies go out and two of the spies come back and they say, we can take this land. Uh, yes, there are giants, but, but God's given it to us. And then, of course, 10 fail to believe God and bring back that negative report. And God judges the people because they fail to believe his promises and move into the land. And remember that the judgment against them was that they would wander in the wilderness, in the desert. Mm for 40 years. And there's, uh, this is recorded a couple of places in scripture, but in Deuteronomy chapter one, this is one of the passages uh, beginning in verse uh, 34. We'll read a, a section here to capture the context. When the Lord heard what you said, he was angry and solemnly swore, no one from this evil generation will see the good land I swore to your ancestors, except Caleb, he will see it, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Because of you, the Lord became angry with me also and said, you shall not enter it, but uh, your assistant Joshua will enter it. So Joshua and Caleb, of course, will enter the promised land. Verse 39, and the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land and I will give it to them and they will take possession of it. And there's a parallel passage in Numbers 14, 29 that mentions them and, and actually clarifies that age 20 and under will enter the land. So what you have is for those 40 years, the entire uh, older generation of Israelites will die off, fail to enter the promised land and will experience God's judgment. All of them except Joshua and Caleb, remember that even Moses won't enter the land. And then there's a threshold. The, the generation that's 20 and younger will not experience that judgment. They will not be judged for the sins of the older generation and the disobedience of the older generation. So some theologians point to that passage as providing biblical support for the idea of either a stage or an age of moral accountability. 
that people are not born automatically, initially accountable to God, but they grow into that, they mature into that and become morally accountable as they attain this knowledge of, quote, good and evil, which is mentioned in Deuteronomy 1. Remember, there's a tree of a knowledge of good and evil in the garden. And um, this knowledge of good and evil is also mentioned in the book of Jonah and also in Isaiah chapter 7. So it's a recurrent theme. And so uh, is it a rock solid case for age of accountability or age of moral responsibility? No, but it is an example where people are treated differently based solely on their age. So, I mean, this is, I mean, no, I don't know anyone who would say like, you can't sin until you're 21. Like I've never, like I've heard people say age of accountability and they're usually saying like when you're, when you're able to give an account, when you know that you're objectively violating God's law, that when you are, you know, you're, your heart is pitted after something that you want versus something that God wants. You're responsible for that action. I mean, but 20, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I know some folk that had done a lot of sin before they were 20. Um, you, you're not, you're not saying that that would be uh, a, the age that after that age that, that you're then accountable. What you're saying is that that is an age bracket that God used in that time in that period to say these people had more knowledge and were sinning against the knowledge that they had been given. Uh, and because of that, there was more severe consequences for those that were younger. Not that the younger couldn't have sinned or weren't sinning, but that the older were uh, more aware, you know, more responsible uh, because they had been given more knowledge and were sinning against that willfully. Is that is that how you would articulate that? Correct. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. So this isn't the age of sin. Mm. This is the age of accountability. So the claim isn't that young children don't sin. I, I, I have four children myself. And, and so as a parent, uh, I can attest that, uh, of course, young, young children, very young children, um, disobey their parents. Well, that's a sin. Yeah. They, they do something and then they lie about it. You can be very young and do that. So my, uh, my, ex my explanation of age of accountability, again, isn't uh, a claim that young children don't sin or, or even that the age of accountability uh, should be extended to the age of 20. I don't know what the age or stage of moral accountability is. My suspicion is it's different for different people because different people attain moral accountability at different times in a similar way that people mature physically and some people, because of mental challenges and uh, genetic uh, differences, may never mature uh, to attain moral accountability. When I was in college, I worked, I volunteered with an organization that uh, would visit people in, a, in an adult home. And I had a friend named Joe who was 60 years old at the time, but he had according to the caretakers of the mind of a five-year-old. He had a child's mind. And I suspect that God uh, might interact with him and judge him and evaluate him as he would deal with a child, even though chronologically he was 60 years old at the time. So I think the age or stage of moral accountability is, um, uh, personal in that sense, uh, God deals with individuals where they are. Okay. So let's, let's talk about that in our need for a savior, because I've heard you say in both podcasts and your book that we're all sinners in need of a savior. Um, at what point in time are we in need for a savior? Is it the moment that we become accountable? Is it from the moment that we're born? Is it from the moment that we're in a womb? Like when it was, is it from conception that we're in need of a savior? Uh, what, at what point time does man need salvation? Um, is it after he has committed his own sin? Um, those kinds of things. And then, then we'll probably jump into Romans chapter five, because that's where all the nitty gritty stuff comes in. Uh, I'd be curious what your answer is. Certainly. On that. So if the question is, what's my own position of when does a person need a savior? Uh, 
there would be one answer and then a, a different answer would be how have other views answered that question. Mm -hmm. So are you asking specifically for my own view? Uh, I mean, we can we can start with the, the, the orthodox positions. I'm comfortable saying, hey, here are positions that are orthodox. Uh, but then I definitely want your opinion. Uh, but like okay. both and. Yeah, why not? Okay, so so the Roman Catholic Church, for example. So this is the largest Christian group on the planet. Right. Right. So the Roman Catholic Church would say that um, that we lost innocence in the garden and that uh, uh, we are born with Adam's guilt and sin, and that needs to be cleansed. And so following Augustine, um, the reason for the baptism of infants is to cleanse them from original sin. So their answer is um, that salvation comes through entrance into the church, which is mediated by infant salvation. Now, uh, Protestants are going to answer differently. Sorry, I muted my mic there. Did, did they, and I don't know this, uh, so I'm, I'm asking this out of ignorance, is, is baptism practiced for um, like, like uh, Roman Catholics, even Lutherans, um, I would assume Anglicans, yeah, Anglicans as well, would all hold, or many of them would hold, to a, uh, a regeneration baptism, though the Roman Catholic version is that of merit, and the Lutheran and Anglican is that of uh, sacramental grace is present. So it's worth distinguishing those two things as different, but all would hold to some form of regenerative baptism. Would they baptize um, children who who would have, and this is, I know this is a sensitive question, but who would have died of, um, you know, sudden infant death or um, a miscarriage of some kind, would they, would they baptize a child who was already dead? Um, I know that's kind of a weird question, but I'm not, I'm not sure of the answer. That's a great question. Before answering that, let me just back up. You made a comment about Lutherans, and uh, I, would, I would clarify that, as you said, different Christian groups will baptize infants for different reasons. Mm-hmm. However, uh, Lutherans, I believe, uh, according to their confessions and some of their key theologians, would not point to uh, baptism as uh, a work of regeneration, but they would point to faith. And they, however, would link baptism with faith. Right, in a sacramental um, but, sense, that, that baptism is the place that grace is found, um, that we are saved by grace. And again, I think Anglicans are in that same camp where they would, in a sacramental sense, not in a meritorious sense, but in a sacramental sense that God has given us grace. If we place faith in Jesus, this is this is the step. And and maybe I'm I'm just mischaracterizing them here. Um, I've got Augsburg. Yeah, it's, I can I can flip open to it. <laughs> it's a it's a fine distinction. I, I think they would say baptized infants are included in God's kingdom by faith. Mm -hmm. And then the question among Lutherans is can infants have faith or or by faith is is faith something that can happen by proxy so the sponsors become significant people parents or uh, other family members or clergy who are present at at an infant's baptism are expressing faith on behalf of that infant and then later in life the infant uh, will grow up and be encouraged to look back at their baptism so there's definitely a strong link between baptism and faith but um but this is, the, the terms that no yeah sorry this is the uh and in, in, uh, this is the augsburg confession article 9 um written by philip melanchthon approved by luther submitted to his majesty right uh of baptism they teach that is necessary to salvation and through baptism is offered the grace of god uh, and that children are to be baptized who being offered to God through baptism are received into God's grace. So um, that, that would be, I guess, the, and then there's a, there's a further articulation. They condemn the Anabaptists who reject the baptism of children uh, and say that the children is saved without baptism. Uh, so that children can be saved without baptism. Um, that, that's the smallest article. There are amendments in here, um, articles which are received uh, and to be corrected. Um, there's tons of stuff in there about baptism that we wouldn't have time to go into.
Um, but I think that I think that's what you and I are talking about. Necessary for salvation, maybe not regenerative. Would that be the the stumbling block there? You think? Yes, that'd be the difference. Yeah, Protestants typically use, yeah. or not Protestants, but like Western mainline denominations use the term regenerative and salvation synonymously, um, where Lutherans don't. I don't think. <laughs> Yeah, they're going to focus on faith. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. So you're you're saying, uh, before I interrupted you, on the question of baptism, yeah, did, did uh, so I guess that was the question, do, would they baptize children who have died in a, in a, in a way to try to um, uh, expunge or remove that guilt, or would they say, hey, the child is dead, there's just, we don't baptize the dead? I'm curious how they, how they approach that um, pastorally. There is there's a strong relationship between the history of the baptism of infants in the church and the development of the doctrine of sin, excuse me, the, the development of the doctrine of original sin understood as inherited guilt. And more than one uh, historical theologian has pointed out that it, it was essentially the practice of infant baptism, which led to the development of the doctrine of original sin. For example, Augustine um, was asked, uh, he was commenting on uh, Psalm 51.5. And in commenting on Psalm 51.5, Augustine uh, wrote, why is it that mothers would rush their infants to baptism unless they had sin uh, which needed to be cleansed. And he went on to quote um, uh, a passage from, uh, what was his key text? He went on to, to quote a passage which, if we look at in our, in our Bibles, uh, doesn't seem to support at all. Job 14.4, the idea of infant guilt, but uh, from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation, there's a concept inserted in that text um, uh, that we don't see in our English translations because our English translations are based on the Hebrew text. Uh, but he quotes from the Septuagint, uh, which refers to um, uh, the makes these statements, who shall be pure of filth, not one even in its life on earth, for one day. And he'll go on in uh, Confessions and the City of God and many other major writings to refer to infant infants as guilty. And he and he will quote a portion of uh, Job 14.4. Um, and so even though um, Romans 5.12 is best known as support for original sin, for Augustine, it was more common in his writings to quote Job 14.4, which is actually uh, no support at all for, for the doctrine. But um, Romans 5 would be a good place to go. Uh, you, I'm not sure I answered your question. This concept of emergency baptism is significant um, because uh, in, in the uh, early church, as this practice of infant baptism developed, it seemed to develop uh, in this context of a, a mystical uh, worldview, um, not simply affirmation of the supernatural that we see in scripture, but a mysticism that goes beyond that. Right. And, um, and frankly, pastors, priests who were willing to baptize infants to give assurance to parents, especially mothers, that they would see their infant child in heaven. And, uh, and then uh, the church sort of looked back and said, now, now, why is it that we're baptizing infants if we don't see explicit examples in Scripture? Oh, sure, it's to wash away the guilt that's received from Adam, just like Augustine told us. And so uh, that that's, in a nutshell, uh, the relationship between this doctrine of original sin defined as inherited guilt and the practice of infant baptism. Right, so like the mat the mortality rates back then for children were just astronomically high, right? People were dying, and hey, how do I know where my kid's going if they die? Like, let's get them baptized. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense as far as the pragmatics of why this would become popular. 
I, my question would just be, there, there are those sudden infant deaths early on before baptism. You know, would, would, has there been, to your knowledge in history, um, accommodations for those who have died in infancy before baptism? Um, like, would they baptize someone who had, to, had been deceased? I, I believe that, at least in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, what they would deal with is extreme unction it would be last rites that would be um, uh, offered, perhaps in that situation. Um, the 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 church has struggled. By that I mean the Roman Catholic Church has struggled with uh, the death of unbaptized infants. And um, around 2005, there was a council that was led by. A theologian who later became uh, Pope Benedict. Uh, so Joseph Ratzinger led this uh, council that studied the topic of uh, the destiny of unbaptized infants. And there was a study of the church fathers, their writings on the topic, uh, some examination of the catechism of the Catholic Church um, and other uh, official doctrine of the church. And their essential conclusion is uh, was not a dogmatic statement. So in other words, the Roman Catholic Church has no official position mm. um, on the eternal destiny of unbaptized infants. The document holds out hope for unbaptized infants, hope of, um, I'm not sure the word salvation is used, but that's the way evangelicals would translate it. Probably, so similar to kind of the way that Grudem talks about children who die in infancy, that if they, they die um, while being raised by Christian parents, that there is a, he, it's a, he says it seems as if there is a higher probability. We're not certain, but we seem as if, seems as if that God would have a special grace. And I haven't picked up his new systematic theology book. I don't know if there's any amendments uh, to this uh, section or responses to your academic work. I'm not sure. Um, uh, but it seems like it's something something like that. Does that seem right? <clears throat> it's similar, and uh, and it, you might have have caught as you as you looked at that particular book that it was Wayne Grudem and his position mm -hmm. in his systematic theology, which set me on on the path to investigating this topic for my dissertation, and That's I've right. stayed with it for the last fifteen years. I I, I can't seem to. There's, there's more to learn about the topic, and I, I'm continually learning and, and uh, growing in my understanding and, uh, of this topic. And um, his position was that all people inherit Adam's guilt and are subject to God's judgment even before they commit an act of sin or attain any sort of moral accountability. So God judges our nature. And... Uh, his position regarding infant salvation, which he is not dogmatic about it, but he offers possible solutions for reconciling how God might save some infants who are uh, guilty, because all are guilty, but they don't have a chance to hear and respond to the message of the gospel. And um, one of one of those uh, possible solutions which I believe he draws from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, a, a concept essentially of household sanctification, mm -hmm. is that children of believers, um, by God's grace, uh, parents can have an assurance that their deceased um, child would be in heaven. The ch one of the challenges with that view is that there is no such assurance for the parents of unbelievers. And so you, you run into this um, salvation by parenthood. Yeah. An infant, an, an, a person who Imputed dies... Imputed righteousness from your parents. <laughs> well, it's not righteousness. It's not imputed righteousness because the child isn't righteous, but some kind of parental covering, if you will. Yes, household sanctification, uh, yeah. because the infant is in the household of a believer. And of course, the challenge is, well, what if only one parent is a believer? Does God's mm. grace extend to the spouse and the child? What if, what if uh, uh, after the death of an infant, the parent becomes a believer? Um, 
uh, and 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 this this conclusion is that if there's no assurance now recognize that Grudem isn't making the statement that the infants in unbelievers homes who die are going to hell he never says that what he says is uh, there's only um, an assurance or the hope of assurance that infants who die would be in heaven if they are children of believers. And so the children of unbelievers wouldn't have that assurance. That's the way he, he frames it. And that is a, uh, a respected position. And uh, I, uh, he's, he's attributing those infants salvation to God's grace and Christ's work on the cross and right. God's work of electing individuals to salvation. And so those are all, um, uh, orthodox, orthodox positions. Yeah. positions and, and it's an acceptable way to do it. And, um, one conversation I had with him in an academic meeting, um, I saw him in the hallway. Hey, Dr. Grudem just wanted to reintroduce myself. We had this exchange. Oh yeah. He was very gracious, and uh, he said, "Well, our positions are are very similar." And I I pointed out, well, uh, and I pointed out the difference that I just mentioned uh, regarding uh, his only offering assurance of salvation for those who die in infancy to the children of believers. And um, in my view, uh, all who die in infancy. Uh, will be with God in heaven by God's grace and through Christ's work on the cross. And and he smiled and he said, uh, but scripture's not clear, is it? And I said, no, sir, it's not. And he said, so maybe you're right. Maybe I'm right. We'll find out in heaven, won't we? And I said, yes, sir, we will. <laughs> Challenge accepted. No, I like it. That's good. Uh, I think that's that's good to, to paint it this way. Now, I I got you off on tangents of uh, the the deceased Baptist and uh, the, those who have deceased before baptism uh, in the in the like the Roman Catholic and the, those who would view baptism as saving. Um, and then I also got you on a tangent on Grudem. You were articulating the Roman Catholic position uh, of infants and inherited guilt, and then you moved on to Protestants. You were about to begin on the Protestant view. Um, can, can you pick up there? Sure. On inherited guilt? I think it was. Is that, that's what we were talking about, right? With uh, uh, Was it inherited guilt? We were talking about the Roman Catholic position on, not on baptism. I'm all distracted now. Um, I think it was inherited guilt, because you talked about uh, the various positions, because I asked you what was your position, and then I asked you what is your position on. Hmm. Let me just give you some I'm major positions now. on original. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so realism is one label, and this is the idea that all people are born corrupt and guilty of Adam's sin because they were present with him in the garden. Uh, that describes Augustine's view. That describes Jonathan Edwards' view. And so um, Augustine, for example, uh, for Augustine, we were seminally present. Now, I'm not going to develop that, but if you remember your biology, that is what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. We, all of humanity was present in Adam seminally. So we were there with him. So when he sinned, we sinned. And because he's guilty, we are guilty. So that's the way that Augustine understood this. Um, Jonathan Edwards for you, of course, one of the most uh, important American theologians uh, that we've, that this country's produced, 18th century theologian. Uh, he wrote a book on this topic and uh, he compared our relationship to Adam like uh, a tree's branches connected to its root. So Adam and his sin and his humanity is the root and we are all connected to him like branches of a tree. And so his sin and his guilt is our sin and our guilt. And, and those are different ways uh, that the, the realist view is, is affirmed. Mediate imputation is the next view. And this is another version of inherited guilt, actually. And this, uh, I think, best represent uh, is best represented by John Calvin. So uh, 
Calvin, although he depends on Augustine for many of his views, uh, his view of original sin was slightly different. So Adam's descendants inherit corruption, but guilt is mediated by one's own sinful actions. Hmm. All right. So there's a corruption that's passed on from Adam. We get this from the Institutes. There's a corruption that's passed on from Adam, but why, why is a person guilty? Because of their own sin. Hmm. So with this, this would, if we're going to draw a parallel between Romans 5, where it says that all have sinned through Adam, and then it talks about all being made right through Christ, and then there's an appropriation of that, like, hey, all have been made right, but that is obtained by faith, right? That's, that, that's obtained by grace through faith in Jesus. So there's an appropriation of that. So all have been corrupted, and there's an appropriation of guilt by willful sin. Is that right? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, your, please your do. Your quotation was more of a paraphrase and interpretation. Um, and, and so let me just read the passage of Scripture because it can be interpreted that way, but it but, um, uh, doesn't have to be. Okay. So Romans 12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Now this now, is five. 12. This is chapter five, verse twelve. I think you said chapter twelve, and I think people are. It's it's verse. I'm it's so chapter sorry. five, verse twelve. I I, I, no, no, I just 12. wanted to catch you. Yeah. Chapter five, verse twelve, and uh, verses twelve through twenty-one are are key, and and really they they all. It, this is a, a a section of thought that is self-contained. It 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 all goes together. These ideas are connected. But um, uh, one, of the, one of the key points about this is that uh, Romans 5.12 doesn't say that we sinned in Adam. It says, um, it says that death came to all people because all sinned. And the challenge is that um, Augustine was reading from uh, a Latin translation, which read at the end, in whom all sinned. So death came to all people in whom all sinned. So the idea for Augustine, because of that text, is um, that all of us sinned in Adam. It, it uh, reaffirmed that view that he had that seminal. Um, we, were, we were seminally present in Adam. Well, the Greek text doesn't say that. And even, even, uh, New Testament scholars and theologians who affirm the inherited guilt view will acknowledge that the view should be developed apart from depending on Romans 5.12. Hmm. Now, there are a couple of exceptions, and Grudem is one of those exceptions. He points to the aorist, like one of his teachers, John Murray, um, to just say that because all sinned, um, that all of us sinned in Adam. But that's not at all what the text says, and uh, I think is an unnecessary and unhelpful conclusion. Um, the The text simply says that uh, sin entered the world through one man, and so it was his act of disobedience through which sin first entered into God's good creation. That's one of the points that Paul is making here, and his larger theme is that uh, Adam's act of disobedience and the consequences for humanity, uh, death and condemnation, were answered by Christ's act of obedience on the cross, offering life and the gift of life. And so th that's the that's the um, the structure of the passage and uh, the argument that that he's making. And so uh, there's. there's Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. Again, I don't, I don't want to tangent, as, so I want to make sure that we were able to, to progress down. You said Augustine's view is seminal, um, Calvin's view, um, you talked about that's, that's more of the corruption view, um, that we're not yes. guilty until we act on our own sin, um, and, and that actually makes sense in light of Romans 5, how they would have each read Romans 5. Um, w was there another position on original sin that we wanted to address? Yes. There was a, uh, isn't there a Zwinglian? Okay. Yes. Yeah, Luther called Zwingli a Pelagian. Yeah. This is an example familiar. of the church history of, of name calling. 
But uh, Zwingli said, look, uh, what is original sin but a disease uh, that one receives from one's parents? And we're not uh, judged for that disease and um, makes an argument basically for age of accountability. And um, uh, yeah, Luther calls him a Pelagian uh, for that particular uh, view. Uh, but that's an example that this this question about inherited guilt doesn't fall along reform, non-reform lines. There are people within the reform tradition who, who deny that we receive Adam's guilt. Um, even some prominent reformed uh, thinkers and theologians today, like Alvin Plantiga, uh, Tom McCall, um, uh, Henri Blochet, wrote uh, a book in the series edited by Don Carson and the book uh, I think is called original sin. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Original sin illuminating the riddle. And uh, he's a reformed theologian and he argues against what he calls alien guilt. And so he, he sort of um, gently uh, tells his own tradition Look, I'm with you guys on most things, but but not on this idea of, of inherited guilt. Uh, and he affirms immediate imputation. Um, so uh, just to mention these views real quick so we don't leave any gaps. Uh, federalism is uh, the idea that all people are corrupt and guilty because Adam represented humanity in the garden. Francis Turretin is the best example of that 17th century theologian. And I'd use a contemporary example to explain this. Uh, the, uh, the federal view of original sin is essentially like congressmen and congresswomen in Washington, D.C. representing us when they vote. They are our representatives in Washington, D.C. Uh, sometimes we agree with the decisions they make, the ballots they, choose, they uh, submit when they vote. Other times we disagree with their policies. Nevertheless, they are our representatives. And in a similar way, Adam was our representative in the garden, and like it or not, he voted when he disobeyed God and became guilty, and he represented all of humanity, and that's why we're guilty. And there's a there's a covenantal explanation for that that Turretin uses. Obviously, he doesn't use uh, 20 and 21st century American politics uh, right. to illustrate that. Um, and then um, conditional imputation is... Uh, Millard Erickson's view, and it's basically he wants to affirm this, both Augustine and Calvin, but he also wants to, to say that people are not guilty for Adam's sin until they first knowingly sin. They attain an age of moral accountability and then sin, and then they're guilty for Adam's sin and their own sin. That's conditional imputation, and, um, and then this, this last view is the one that I mentioned that uh, is is widely held, uh, though uh, I don't know that it's the majority position, but it is widely held, and there are many um, proponents throughout church history, um, inherited consequences. We inherit the consequences of Adam's sin, a corrupt nature, mortality, a fallen world, but we become guilty only uh, due to our own sin, and we're only under condemnation due to our own sin. Um, yeah, and I think I, I had asked... Go ahead. Go mm -hmm. ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to rattle off some examples. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, Athanasius, Cyril of Alexandria, John Chrysostom. Chrysostom, known as Golden Mouth, said, yes, we baptize infants, but not because they're guilty of any sin. Right. Um, uh, and so in the in the West and in the East, um, this was the case. Uh, J. N. D. Kelly is a was a prominent historical theologian. He writes, "There's hardly a hint in the Greek fathers that mankind as a whole shares in Adam's guilt," and uh, and that's also true of of the Latin. Uh, in in medieval theologians, you can look at Anselm. In Reformed theology, you can look at Zwingli that you mentioned. Um, Baptist, that's my own tradition. We're divided on this. Uh, some would affirm an inherited guilt. Others in, uh, affirm this inherited consequences. However, I would note that um, among Baptists, we're united on infant salvation. And I think that's true in many other traditions that um, they may be unsure about exactly how to describe infants, 
But when it comes to the question of infant salvation, there is a, there is a strong leaning toward God's grace being extended to infants. And I think for good reason, um, but, uh, and you're just uh, answering even the though, mechanics of all that. Yes. What I was trying to do in my study and continued to do in, in asking this question, what is the spiritual condition of infants is I'm trying to get behind the question of infant salvation. Yeah. So before, before we say, well, this, this I think is how God treats, uh, those who, uh, tragically, um, don't live beyond infancy. Well, let's talk first about living infants. Let's talk about infants in the womb and the very, very young, you know, the six month old infant, the one year old infant. Uh, how should we talk about them? How should we consider them? Are they sinners? If they are, why are we calling them sinners? Is it because they're descendants of Adam? Okay. Well, if they're sinners, then are they guilty? Because if they're not guilty, then you have a not guilty sinner. And that sounds strange. So maybe we shouldn't call them sinners. Well, but I thought everyone was a sinner hmm. because of the nature that we're born with, or are we sinner because we sin, we commit acts of sin. And that's a, that is the question that is disputed and there are different explanations. It's my own position that God judges us for sinful thoughts, attitudes, and actions, not because of our nature. So you would say, so, would you say that we have a sinful nature, but we are not sinners until we make an action of sin? Would that be a fair distinction? Years, yes. Uh, and and um, in, in my writings on this topic for the last 10 years, I've argued for an inherited sinful nature. I have a systematic theology uh, that I've completed. The publisher has it. Now I'm working on revisions and in the section where I articulate um, this inherited consequences view, I, I um, acknowledge that as an option, but I no longer argue for an inherited sinful nature. Um, rather, uh, rather acknowledge the inclination towards sin and the possibility of sin, but do not argue that we have a sinful nature. And um, that... Uh, that may be something that I'll catch some heat for in academic circles and probably have to defend because it's, uh, could be a shocking claim. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm only making it after thinking through the issue carefully. Interesting. So you would, okay, that, that is interesting. Um, what, I think I asked you at the, uh, the the middle portion where we were we had a hiccup of like oh how am I going to answer this I think the question that I had asked was when are we in need of a savior and you gave me like a Roman Catholic position like when when is it that we are in need of salvation um, and if we're going to say that we are not born with a sinful nature um, I don't understand I guess I don't really understand your position of sinful corruption what is the corruption if we don't if it's not our nature. Um, that's something I guess I would be confused with because that, that would, that would sound Pelagian to my ears and you'd have to explain to me why it is not that, um, we are born with a nature that is not bent towards sin and thus could live a life without sin. Um, when I hear the term sinful nature, it's that our nature as humans is, um, a proclivity to not just that of temptation, but to rebel against God. Right. So to your question, when does a person need a savior? Mm -hmm. Every person needs a savior at any time in their life. Okay. So from the moment of, a con of conception, if, if that person, so I'm going to call that fertilized egg or mm -hmm. that embryo, the earliest moment of life, um, when a, whenever a person is a person, right, mm -hmm. at the earliest point, um, that person is in need of redemption, but I, but I don't call them a sinner because there's no need to call them a sinner because they haven't sinned. You say, well, if they're, if, if you're not going to call them a sinner, then, uh, well, and let me, let me back up for a moment. Um, when Jesus pointed to 
examples of citizens of the kingdom, who did he point to? Children. Children, exactly. So that was a great opportunity for Jesus to tell those kids to repent of their sin, and he didn't, or to talk about them as vipers and snakes like he did the religious leaders, but he didn't. He pointed uh, to them as infants, uh, those infants and children as, as examples of citizens of the kingdom. Um, Let me take another approach. Uh, All Christians affirm the humanity and divinity of Christ. That's right. So uh, Jesus was fully human and truly human. Mm -hmm. All right. So was he genuinely human or uh, just appeared to be human? He was he was genuinely human and he was tempted in every way. And yet he was without sin. So, uh, so what does it mean to be human? What, what is genuine human nature? If we say that genuine human nature is, is sinful, then uh, that causes a problem for our Christology. Because Jesus, as Athanasius argued in, in the incarnation of the word, Uh, He became human to redeem humans, right? And What he did uh, not assume, he could not redeem, right? What is unassumed is unredeemed. Sure. Um, And so unless you're willing to say that Jesus had a sinful human nature, which I'm not willing to say, he was the same kind of human we are. Now, so the property of being sinful is common to humanity. But humanity in its nature is not sinful because Jesus had a fully human nature. So it's a careful distinction. But you would say Adam Uh, had a fully human nature as well, right? Yes. And Adam had an opportunity to obey God or disobey God, and he disobeyed God. And as a result, that introduced sin into uh, creation. And um, well, let me let me do this. Southern Baptists are a large group. Uh, we certainly don't represent all Protestants, but uh, we're, we're, the, we're the largest Protestant group right now in the United States. Our confession of faith addresses this topic and the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, as well as the 1963 version, talks about what we inherit. And it doesn't say we inherit Adam's guilt. It says all people inherit a nature and environment inclined towards sin a nature and environment inclined towards sin. I think that's a great explanation. And that's what I affirm. My nature, I I have this bent towards sin. Um, And uh, I'm a broken human. Jesus wasn't a broken human. So, so Jesus is the model for humanity, not me. So often we get it backwards and we say, well, we say, uh, well, uh, Jesus isn't like me, so he doesn't know what it's like to be human. Well, uh, Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin, Scripture says. Um, but he's the model for humanity. I'm not the model for humanity. I'm the mm-hmm. model for fallen humanity and sinful mm-hmm. humanity. Right. But but he's genuine humanity and he he doesn't have a sinful nature. He didn't have a sinful nature. I have I have this um, problem with sin. Um and, and it goes back to my earliest stages. Uh, I think that's what David was getting at when he said, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, Psalm 51.5. David wasn't saying, and you can just look around at any, any of the uh, commentaries on uh, Psalm 51.5. David wasn't saying that his mom had done, had done something sinful uh, to make him a sinner. He wasn't referring to original sin. Uh, he's simply making a broad statement that uh, uh, from his earliest times, he's had this tr- problem with sin. Surely I was sinful at birth, but not that he was committing sinful actions in the womb. Um, so this 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 conversation so the, was spurred on by, like, when do we need a, 
when does mankind need a savior? And I think your response was, you know, um, children need redemption. But if we're going to use the word yes. redemption or salvation, what do they need redemption from? What do they need salvation from? Um, th this would be the hard part for me to make that distinction because for me, it's like okay. they need salvation mm -hmm. from sin, right? They need to be delivered from the power of sin, um, the the penalty of sin. That's that's why we need salvation. And I'm I am comfortable in saying that God um, is is judging the infant justly, that God is is judging them rightfully, um, and, and 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 making that same kind of allotment to say that we have a sinful nature. Uh, but we're not a sinner until we act on sin. I, I'm more comfortable with that language, but in saying that we're not born with a sinful nature, it makes a, it makes it confusing to me for what we're being saved from. And, and would it be possible for a person who is born without a sinful nature to continue on living without sin? At least in theory, it seems to be possible. Listen, I, I'm comfortable if someone wants to keep the sinful nature language. I mm -hmm. argued for it for a long time, and and I certainly do um, think that's a a, um, a position that's more common than uh, what I've suggested. Um, <clears throat> I, I would, if someone wants to read uh, something that's already in print on this topic, Tom McCall in his book Against God and Nature um actually deals with this topic and um mccall's book is in that series foundations of evangelical theology published by crossway edited by john feinberg against god and nature um uh, mccall teaches now at uh asbury university he was at mm -hmm. trinity evangelical for a long time uh, but he he's uh he articulates uh these this position carefully uh, he doesn't advocate for it strongly, but he does advocate for it. And he does point out the problem of arguing for a sinful nature. He points to the humanity of Christ and uh, the fact that there was no sinful nature in Christ. And um, uh, so there's someone else to, to consider um, his argument for this. Scripture talks about the redemption of humanity. Um, uh, and so recall that um, Jesus at the end of uh, the Bible is making all things new. Revelation chapter 21 and 22, there's a, there's a new heaven and a new earth. There's a new type of existence. And there's a redemption of God's creation. And it's not only individual sinners who will experience this redemption uh, that we see. And I'm doing this because resurrection from the dead, the resurrection of their bodies, uh, the re reuniting of um, those believers in Christ um, with these glorified bodies. Uh, but there's also the redemption of creation. Creation groans, the language of Romans chapter eight, for its redemption. And so what we have is there will be inanimate objects, God's creation that will be redeemed, right? Um, scripture suggests the possibility of animals in creation and streams and, well, a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. And so uh, God's people, the redeemed, will populate this new heaven and new earth. So it's possible that God's redemption of creation includes those who die in infancy. So this redemption of creation is, first of all, grounded in the person and work of Christ. Nobody's going to be in heaven, whether they're an adult, they, they die, uh, they step into eternity as an adult or a child or an infant. Nobody's going to be in heaven apart from God's grace purchased through Christ's life, death on the cross, burial, and resurrection. So that's the only basis uh, for life with God. J Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Um, and so, so he's the basis for uh, this new creation. And so the, the speculation is that perhaps this is the way uh, God achieves this. I would remind, uh, I would remind you that any 
any salvation uh, in any of these models of an infant is going to be a passive application of the atonement. In other words, in none of the models uh, of original sin or infant salvation do you have an infant confessing faith in Christ in the womb or at six months old. The basis of their salvation is God's grace expressed through Christ's work on the cross. But none of the positions are arguing for confession of faith, uh, with the possible exception of, of those who deal with postmortem opportunities or postmortem salvation. In other words, after the death of an infant, maybe that infant matures, um, meets Christ, has an opportunity for faith. A.H. Strong, a Baptist theologian of a previous century, did that. John Piper um, speculates uh, in a footnote in his book, Is Jesus the Only Way? That perhaps God deals with infants in that way. And Terrence Thiessen um, writes about that in his book where he argues for accessibilism. So there are theologians who um, have have dealt with that topic. No, I can um, I can agree with you and affirm, you know, no one's going to be in the new heavens and the new earth apart from God's grace. Um, I can affirm that even the children who die in infancy, um, this is uh, a work of God's grace. Um, and you even use the word atonement. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious, what is being atoned for? And what does God's grace, what is it needed for if we don't have a sinful nature and we don't have like, like, like at minimum, it's our sinful nature in my mind, but I'm like, what, what else could it be if there's no guilt um, and there's no sinful nature? What is it that he is saving us from? What is it that his grace is needed for? Why do we need his atonement? You see what I'm saying? Death. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So he's, um, he's redeeming us from death. Which, so yeah, he's, he's, so it's, so he is redeeming us from a consequence of someone else's sin, not necessarily for our own, um, from our own sinfulness. He's not saving us from, from ourselves, from the sin that's within us. He's saving us from Adam's sin. When we say we, if you're talking about a person in the womb or a six month old child, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, you, you cut off. You said uh, uh, you cut off there. You said, uh, uh, "Are you talking?" When you say "we," do you mean a six-month-old child or someone in the womb? And then that right then, right, right when you were giving your explanation, you cut off. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I lost my my train of thought. Uh, you know, um, sin and death were consequences from the first couple's rebellion in the garden. Um, I lost you again. For what does God judge people, their nature or for their sinful thoughts, attitudes, and actions? I think in scripture, over and over, what we see is God judges people for sinful thoughts, attitudes, and actions, not for the nature that they inherit, not because of um, Adam's sin. Um, sin has consequences, and we inherit those consequences. We're, we're born into a fallen world. Um, I don't think perfection, apart from God's work, uh, through Christ is possible. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a, living a sinless life is not possible. Um, and can you explain to me why that is? Like, why is it impossible to live a sinless life if we don't have a sinful nature? And again, I'm, I'm not trying to, 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 to grill yeah. you here. I'm just trying to... I, there are connections my, my brain just cannot make with, with, the, with yeah. the idea we're not born to the sinful nature. So keep, keep walking me through it. Yeah. Uh, well, Scripture's testimony is that everybody's a sinner. And we demonstrate that by our lifestyle. At the earliest possible times, we are disobedient to parents. We um, worship created things rather than the, than the Creator. Um, we rebel against authority. Um, we, we demonstrate that we're sinners. 
And so, right. so I'm but guilty. I, I guess my question, and, my question is why? Like, why is no one able, why is no one righteous? No, not one. Why is no one able to seek after God? Like, why, why isn't it that possible that one person can say, hey, like, I don't have anything that's drawing me. Like, like w- my answer for a person who's born with a sinful nature is because we cannot, because we will not, right? Like, like a pretty reformed position is that I can't choose God because I hate him, right? Because my nature as a fallen person is in opposition towards God. Now, God, I don't think judges that until we act upon that, um, which I, I, I suppose would be some form of age of accountability. But I would say that my will is unable to come to God unless his grace draws me and liberates me from that. Um, but but another position that we weren't born with sin, it, it, at least it seems as if it opens the door in a sense to say, you could live a life without sin. It's at least theoretically possible. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you deny that people do it, but it seems as if it at least leaves the door open for the possibility. Yeah, it's just not in the biblical model. Life is found in relationship with God. And uh, we were locked away from the tree of life and free access to relationship with God in the garden. And, and that's a consequence. And maybe that answers your question. You know, how, how is it that people, you know, um, don't live sinless lives today? Although I'm not sure that would be an adequate question because Adam and Eve had perfect access to God and they had access to the tree of life and they still sinned. So um, the nature of humanity is the possibility to sin. And, uh, and I'm comfortable uh, and and uh, fully affirm and and really embrace the language of uh, uh, the Baptist faith and message that talks about uh, a nature and environment inclined towards sin. I think that I think the challenge of going beyond a statement about inclination is you indict the human nature of Jesus, which causes problems for the atonement. Um, and so, I understand the concern, especially if uh, one is used to uh, certain narratives about human nature and who we are. But I would just continue to point people back to Scripture well, and to wrestle with those issues. Could I say that Jesus's nature is like Adam's nature in that he could sin and that he is perfectly human? Like Adam was as human as any of us are, um, but our nature is a nature... Um, uh, and, and maybe I'm appealing to federal headship here. I'm not quite sure. You, you'd probably be able to tell, uh, attest to this more than I could. But I'm in Adam, right? And and then when I have faith, then I'm in Christ. So Christ is this second Adam in that he he has he has the I suppose opportunity, the temptation, just as Adam had, just as human as Adam was. Um, I'm not affirming that Christ was uh, sinful. I would say that he was born in the likeness of sinful flesh. I would say I would I would uh, uh, suggest that he is tempted in every manner in which we are. Um, that that he has this weakness that we have, uh, and that this assuming of weakness um, is is that of his humanity that he is able to where God cannot sin. Um, and I can I can affirm all of those statements without saying that Jesus is a sinner, um, and that Jesus has a sinful nature. Um, but, but to say that he is the perfect representation of humanity um, and that we are assumed into that. Um, is that, is that what, what's, what's the difficulties with that in saying that, that Adam um, is, if you will, a federal head and Jesus is another, I guess, federal head in that they're both perfectly fully human and without sin? Uh, but that because Adam sinned and we're born into Adam, that we're sinners and that we need to be born again into Christ Jesus um, to to take that nature. Um, what yeah. is that? Um, yeah, it, I guess, again, this is just it's almost foreign to me because, again, I'm reading uh, your book on uh, uh, infant baptism and not infant baptism uh, on infant salvation. And I'm, I'm banging on all cylinders this uh, amendment that you said that you've you've uh, you've come to after, I guess, uh, Tom McCall. Um, I, I, did you say that you, you came to this conclusion after reading Tom McCall? Um, I might be. No, actually, I've, I've wrestled with it. Um the entire time, even, okay. even when I was, uh, 
the day that I was awarded my PhD, I, I walked I walked out on the stage with a, a friend of mine who who also completed his program at the same time in theology. And backstage, one of the things he asked me was, "Okay, so explain to me exactly what you mean by sinful human nature." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and I and I couldn't. Yeah. But but I told him that's it's still my view. I, I I can't I can't explain to you what I mean by that, but it's the best explanation for the texts that I'm looking at and um, trying to put together these big issues regarding sin, God's judgment, uh, infant salvation. Um, and so, so, so I've, I've been, I've been working on it for a long time. Um, but, but he is one person, not, not the only person um, who, uh, who makes that distinction. Okay. Well, I don't want to keep you longer than I have. I've told you I, I'd give you an hour. Inter- I told you I'd give you an hour interview. I, I asked for an hour interview of you, uh, the exact opposite of what I meant to say. Uh, and I've taken 20 minutes extra of your time. I hope I haven't uh, uh, <laughs> time gouged you here. I apologize. No, not at all. I, I, I would be interested in, in making a quick comment. Um, you you talked you you made a comparison between Adam and Christ and asked if Christ human nature could be like Adam's human nature in that Adam could have sinned. And uh, even that is disputed uh, in, in, uh, in theology. There's discussion about whether or not Christ could have sinned. Now, right. those who discuss this will affirm that he did not sin. But the question is, could he have sinned? If you begin with the humanity of Christ, then you say, well, if he was fully human and he was tempted in every way, then he could have sinned. However, if you begin with the divinity of Christ, then you say Jesus as God could not sin because God cannot sin. Uh, He can't be tempted by sin and doesn't sin. And so then you're stuck with this impeccability, peccability debate. And in my estimation, uh, it's it's a question that cannot be answered because of the nature of the incarnation. Uh, This is unique that you have not simply these two natures, but, but these two natures in union with one another. And so it's an impossible question to answer in that sense, because Jesus is both truly divine and human. That's right. Um, and, and this question about, uh, being in Adam and in Christ, um, there's a lot to it, but I, I would, but I would ask you, um, uh, is it necessary to ratify the work of Christ in order to be in Christ? Or are you automatically in Christ? I would say, no, you're not automatically in Christ. Yeah, yeah, I would affirm that. And I think I think most evangelicals uh, would affirm that as well. So so there's um, there's discontinuity in that parallel because you're not born into Christ. You're you're. Um, uh, you must ratify the work of Christ on your behalf by repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus. In a similar way, uh, it could be argued that we need to ratify the work of Adam. We're not simply born into this uh, this state where we are in Adam, but we must ratify the work of Adam, which was his sin in the garden by our own sin, uh, thus ratifying uh, Adam's work. And then, uh, that parallel, I think is, is closer to, um, what you already affirm. Well, I think we need to have a a second conversation on, uh, probably just anthropology, because I think ultimately uh, for people who are looking for questions about, um, infants and infant deaths, there are actually quite a few positions that we've presented, um, that, that could uh, spend quite a bit of time of study on. If you're watching, uh, maybe you've had a miscarriage, maybe you had a child who's passed, and uh, we mourn with you, and and super sorry that that the nature of sin and this fallen world has has caused such a, a horrible thing to take place. Um, and I use the nature of sin in talking about the fallen world. Um, uh, so so we, you know we grieve with you, our prayers are with you, and 
Um, we know what, I know what that's like. Um, our, uh, my wife and I have had miscarriages before, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking. And, and for someone who's had a, a sudden infant death, someone who's, who's already been born, uh, that you, you have a relationship with and you wean and, and they pass, um, uh, we, we have confidence that they are with the Lord. Um, and I hope that this episode can be assuring to you. Uh, but uh, on the side note of that, the conversations of theology, so there's this pastoral aspect that we really hope this can comfort you, but there's also this theological aspect where where we want to grapple with the nitty gritties of this all. Because uh, if there was anything Christians should fight about and fight for, it's it's what God has done through the cross of Jesus and sal- and the salvation of humanity. So the particulars on this are are worth fighting both charitable and hospitably for, um, and and fighting against. You know, uh, as as some of these positions we would say are unorthodox. So. Um, it's worth wrestling through, uh, and I hope, Adam, that you'll come back on uh, if you're interested, maybe even a couple of weeks, and and talking us through some of these anthropology pieces, and I'll, I'll probably send you a bunch of questions in advance because uh, th- this is just so foreign to me, I can't even wrap my head around. Uh, there's just so many rabbit trails I want to go down, but what about this, and what about that? Uh, and I really would want to have those questions really formulated carefully. So I, I appreciate you coming on and spending time with us and, and going over the time that I had asked of you. Uh, I really appreciate it. Certainly it is my, my pleasure. And, and let me ask you, you did a good job of uh, mentioning the pastoral application. Could I take just two minutes sure, and speak do. to that issue? Because we've done only theology and no pastoral ministry at this point. Uh, just a word to those parents who have lost an infant due to miscarriage or abortion or stillbirth or some sort of tragedy. Um, because scripture is meant to bring hope and encouragement, regardless of one's position on original sin and some of the issues that we talked about. Uh, several points very quickly. Uh, the first one is this. Your child was wonderfully and uh, fearfully made, Psalm 139. Uh, next, parents should never have to bury a child. Life should not be that way. Uh, David modeled in Psalm 13 that uh, we can ask God questions during dark times, and he brought his pain to God and uh, continually put his hope and his trust in God. Uh, next, uh, the death of infants demonstrates that this world is broken, uh, but Christ, through his death on the cross, has defeated death and will remake and restore his broken world. Uh, where there will be no death, mourning, or crying, Revelation 21. Uh, Next, God is present. He can provide you hope and joy and peace as you trust him, Romans 15, 13. Next, uh, Jesus welcomed little children. We referred to this passage, Mark chapter 10. He pointed to them as examples for adults of citizens in God's kingdom. And just as Jesus welcomed little children during his earthly ministry, he still welcomes them into heaven. He does the same thing now that he did 2,000 years ago. He welcomes them into his arms and he blesses them. Uh, Next, like King David, who mourned the death of his infant son, parents who know the Lord, because only uh, parents who know the Lord will be in heaven, can say, like David, one day I'll go and be with that child. Uh, 2 Samuel 12, 23. So you parents have a solid biblical basis for the hope that one day you'll be reunited uh, reunited with your child. And then last, Jesus alone is is the resurrection and the life. He's our only hope for resurrection and reunion with our loved ones, whether they're adults, children, or infants. Josh, I I appreciate the time to visit with you and uh, to speak to your audience. Yeah, and likewise, and I hope we can continue this conversation in the future. Uh, for those of you who are watching, and man, you want to you wanna learn more about subjects like this, make sure to hit subscribe, like the video as we're coming out with content just like this every single week. Uh, I've got content coming out. Uh, we, we actually had Francis Chan reach out and say, hey, you know, I say he reached out. I sent him an email and he responded to it. Man, I've, I've really not been good with talking about what I'm doing versus what our, our guests are doing uh, today. Uh, but uh, uh, Francis is looking to, to, to get a time slot that is available. So hopefully we'll have him on in the near future. Uh, we've got um, uh, also a video coming up with uh, Dawson on Jeremiah 23 that we're going to release here on YouTube. Uh, and then we've got uh, another video coming out with Dr. 
Dr. Michael Heiser, which is going to be quite popular on the Book of Enoch. So a lot of really good content uh, coming down the pipe. If you guys like this video and interested in following more of our content, make sure to subscribe. And if you've been blessed by the ministry uh, at all and you want to support what we're doing, there's a couple ways you can give. In the links of the description, there's a PayPal link. You can give a one-time gift, or you can give there on Patreon. Uh, those who give on Patreon as low as five bucks a month, you get extra content. Uh, but if you do see us post something and you're like, hey, I can't afford five bucks a month, I get it, been there, uh, shoot me a message and I can send you that content. It's just the way that we uh, have best been able to support the channel. I want to thank all of you who do support us as uh, it is not free to, to produce content like this. Uh, lights, cameras, recording, podcasting, uh, hosting spaces cost money. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode and we will see you next week. Blessings.